Comic books, science fiction, fantasy, anime. For brevity's sake, let's just say nerd culture in general. On occasion, I have a moment of such surreal feelings that it catches me off guard. When I take a step back and realize all the comic movies and shows that exist, all the amazing sci-fi, contributing to making these mediums just far more popular than they ever have been. How great most of the media is. How much enjoyment people get from them. I half-jokingly think, I must have died, or I'm in a coma, or I'm plugged into the Matrix, or something. It's uncanny. My older brothers were deep into nerdy things by the time I came along. It seems unreal sometimes that I grew up loving this stuff and wishing other people would see the immense value in it. The escapism, sure, but also the humanity. The comfort. The guidance found in the characters, many of whom are defined not merely by their powers and costumes, but by what they choose to do with lessons taught to them through trauma and pain and loss. As a kid, often picked on and alienated due to my fascination with comics and science fiction, I wanted so badly for more people to recognize it. And now, so, so many people do. And it's just... I don't tend to place myself in the center of reality and see myself as Neo because that's an extremely unhealthy mindset. But in those odd moments for a few seconds every now and then, I can't help but ponder the serendipitous fact that millions and millions of people of all ages, races, genders, sexualities, religions, nationalities, and perspectives see the same things I always have. Or maybe they see something else, informed by their unique and diverse perspectives which is equally satisfying to me, even if I can't possibly fathom that specific connection. I've lived a difficult life, set in motion long before I had any agency or choice in the matter. Things are much better now, after years of painful self-analysis, self-work, and self-love. But comics, sci-fi, fantasy, fandom, these are what inspired me to grow and persevere. I have to credit a few people in recent years who helped me grow into someone I respect, who, surprisingly, other people sometimes respect as well. But I wasn't always someone worth much respect. I credit my fandoms in comics and Star Trek for planting the seeds long ago that allowed me to grow into who I am. As I write this, a tear forms in the corner of my eye just thinking that so many others have that now too, and many who live far more challenging lives than I have particularly with the state of the world, the uncertainty and the fear and instability, I'm glad they at least have those connections and can be inspired to push through. So it really puzzles me when someone who claims to have the same love for comics and other nerdy media find nothing of value in it except the self-centered value they get from shitting on it or angrily starting conflict with fans, fans just trying to enjoy the thing in their own way. Even more confusing is some of them go on to make a living doing this on YouTube and websites, even creating their own comics out of spite for the media they use as a bludgeon, all while claiming to love the thing. Not just that they claim to love it, but they insist on being the arbiters of fandom, of the media itself, creating nebulous, ever-shifting barriers and standards that they feel entitled to impose on everyone else. It's the polar opposite of that surreal, warm feeling I mentioned before. A fan, originally short for fanatic, is an enthusiastic person who exhibits strong interest, passion, or admiration for something or somebody, such as a celebrity or a sport or a team, a fiction genre, a politician, a book, a movie, a video game, or an entertainer. Although if you're a fan of a politician, um, don't be. Collectively, the fans of a given object or person is called a fan base, or a fandom. Fans might show their enthusiasm in various ways, like promoting the object of their interest, being members of a related fan club, holding or participating in fan conventions, or writing fan mail. I suppose people don't really write fan mail much these days. It's usually fan tweeting, fan shitposting, ranting. They might also do creative activities called fan labor, such as creating fanzines, writing fan fiction, making memes, or drawing fan art. In more contemporary terms, they may create YouTube videos or live streams, 
Merriam-Webster traces the uses of the Merriam-Webster traces Merriam-Webster traces the usage of the term fandom back as far as 1903. A fandom is a subculture composed of fans characterized by a feeling of empathy and camaraderie with others who share that common interest. Fans typically are interested in even minor details of the objects of their fandom and spend a significant portion of their time and energy involved with their interest, often as part of a social network with particular practices, differentiating fandom-affiliated people from those with only a casual interest. Fans of the literary detective Sherlock Holmes are generally considered to have been the first modern fandom, holding public demonstrations of mourning after Holmes was killed off in 1893 and creating some of the first fan fiction as early as 1897. Many fandoms overlap. There are large conventions that center around overlapping fandoms such as film, comics, anime, TV shows, where they can cosplay, meet the creators or performers, and buy and sell related merchandise. Annual conventions like Comic-Con International, WonderCon, DragonCon, and New York Comic-Con are some of the most well-known and highly attended events that cater to these overlapping fandoms. Fan subcultures really began to blossom in the 1930s, surrounding the genres of sci-fi and fantasy. Worldcon, or more formally, the World Science Fiction Convention. The annual convention of the World Science Fiction Society is a science fiction con held every year since 1939, except for the years of 1942 through 1945 during World War II. Science fiction fandom split off into media fandom in the early 1970s with a focus on relationships between characters on TV and movie media franchises, such as Star Trek and The Man from UNCLE. Fans of those franchises generated creative products like fan art and fan fiction at a time when typical science fiction fandom was focused on more critical discussions. The Media West convention provided a video room and was instrumental in the emergence of fan vids or analytic music videos based on a source in the late 70s. By the mid-70s, it was possible to meet fans at science fiction cons who did not read science fiction, just viewed it on film or TV. The ways which fans consumed, analyzed, and engaged in their fandoms began to grow out into many directions. Star Trek fandom, one of the first fandoms, is still strong today and has been in a decades-long conversation with the producers and creators, contributing to shows that often get much better as they progress. The first seasons of each series, with a couple of exceptions, are shaky at best before they get their legs in later seasons and going on to become iconic, partially due to fan feedback. Anime and manga fandom began in the 1970s in Japan. In America, the fandom also began as an offshoot of science fiction fandom with fans bringing imported copies of Japanese manga to conventions. The rise of the internet created new and powerful outlets for fandom. This began with audio engineers trading Grateful Dead set lists and discussing the setup of the band's concert speaker system on ARPANET, which was a precursor to the internet. After the birth of the World Wide Web, many communities adopted the practices of deadheads, planting the seeds for passionate, active fandom practices that we see everywhere today. Star Trek fans, led mostly by female fans, rallied to revive the cancelled TV series in 1968. Same with Cagney and Lacey in 1983, Xena Warrior Princess in 1995, Roswell in 2000 and 2001, Farscape in 2002, Firefly in 2002, and Jericho in 2007. Though in the case of Firefly, the result was the movie Serenity, not another season. It was likewise the fans who facilitated the push to create a Veronica Mars film through a Kickstarter campaign. Signaling the dawn of the age of fandom on social media, fans of the show Chuck launched a campaign to save the show from cancellation using a Twitter hashtag and buying products from sponsors of the show. Many people heading those campaigns were women and queer fans, and we'll discuss the importance of those specific fans later. We'll also discuss the flip side of that fandom evolution. As fandoms became more popular in every medium, franchise owners began to monetize the enthusiasm and use it as a self-powered engine of promotion. In 1988, DC Comics allowed Batman fans to vote for the fate of the second Robin, Jason Todd. Would the Joker kill him, or would he survive? In science fiction, a large number of the practitioners and other professionals in the field, not only writers but editors and publishers, traditionally have themselves come from and participated in their science fiction fandoms. From Ray Bradbury and Harlan Ellison to Patrick Nielsen Hayden and Tony Weisskopf, Ron Moore, creator of the Battlestar Galactica reboot, got his start on Star Trek, but was a fan of the USS Enterprise long before writing for the franchise. 
Ed Brubaker was a fan of Captain America comics as a kid, and he was so upset that Bucky Barnes was killed, that once he became a writer of the series, he devised a brilliant way to revive him, with the Winter Soldier arc in 2004. A character that had been canonically dead for over half a century was resurrected and modernized into a far more complex and profitable one by someone who, as a kid, was just a fan, no different from any other. Distinctions between a fandom and a religion are surprisingly blurry as far as sociologists are concerned. With social media building bridges between like-minded individuals, fandoms aren't just online subcultures, they are participatory cultures. If we're looking at patterns of collective subculture human behavior, religions fit under this category as well. Henry Jenkins, professor of communications at the University of Southern California and professional super nerd, explains the facets of participatory culture. Relatively low barriers to artistic expression and civic engagement. Strong support for creating and sharing one's creations with others. Some type of informal mentorship in which the most experienced members pass along their knowledge and wisdom to the novices. Members who believe that their contributions matter and members who feel some degree of social connection with one another and care about other members' opinions about their contributions. If we view fandom and religion as similar subcultures, at least in terms of collective behavioral patterns, we must view the acceptance of varied methods of engagement as equally valid. I'm a secular humanist. I'm not a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, but I accept that others are and that they deserve their space to worship. I might not agree and I might even find it all a bit silly, but I believe strongly in self-determination, the freedom of expression, and that everyone deserves a connection to something that makes existence even the slightest bit more fulfilling. They, as fellow human beings, have the right to engage with their faith on their terms, provided they aren't using said faith as a tool for violence, bigotry, or alienating others who share that faith. Viewing fandom as the same kind of subculture at the sociological level I extend that same acceptance toward fandoms I am not involved in and to those who engage in my fandoms but in different ways than I do. You may go to church on Sundays and I'm glad you have that ritual, that community. Likewise, you might go to furry conventions and just as I don't understand the interest in Christ, I don't understand the desire to wear anthropomorphized costumes, not in public anyway. But I am happy that you have that connection all the same and I will fight for your freedom to have it. I love that you have it. It's no secret I'm a comic book fan. I read, collect, discuss, go to cons, and since I've been making YouTube content, I've been fortunate enough to talk to comic creators and just hundreds of other fans. But maybe you just like to read one comic title a month, and maybe when you're done, you throw it in a disorganized pile without even bothering to use bags and boards. You should have boards in there, bloody savage. While seeing that pile may cause me to shudder in terror, or knowing that you have zero interest in Spider-Man could send me into existential despair, it's not my place to tell you you're wrong, or that you haven't met some arbitrary metrics for being a fan. I am happy that you have that connection, and I will fight for your freedom to have it. I love that you have it. I'd much rather you have a connection, a relationship to fandom that I can't possibly comprehend than for you to not have it at all.